my name is uh, Yitka, I'm from Czech Republic, I'm from Greenpeace, and today I would like to convince you that uh, finding friends that will uh, support your work financially is quite easy, even though our region uh, really likes yeah, philanthropy you. culture, and I think it's our role as an NGO to you know, revive this, uh, this uh, culture. So even though it seems impossible, it is. Uh, just a few words about me. I'm doing fundraising for 11 years now in a row, uh, so I know it works. I started in Greenpeace and uh, as uh, we mentioned already, Greenpeace doesn't accept any governmental or corporate money. So all our activities are financed by individuals. At the moment we have 14,000 dollars in Czech Republic and all our activities in Czech Republic are financed by Czechs. And for the last two or three years we even contribute into the global campaign. Uh, after I uh, left Greenpeace uh, in uh, 2005, I work for Nada Sevilla, we are a foundation that somebody of you might know. It's, uh, I think, one of the most active Czech foundations <coughs> and uh, it supports uh, the development of civil society. So they do a lot of grant making for grassroots groups, they do a lot of trainings for uh, civil society organizations and they have a special program on promoting philanthropy, not only in the Czech Republic but also in the region. And I'll show you some uh, successful examples how the foundation is raising funds from individuals to support uh, watchdog groups in, uh, in the regions, grassroots groups. Uh, While well, I was working in VIA, I also set up uh, two projects focused on uh, using technologies in non-profit sector. One of them is Darwin.cz, which would be translated as Let's Donate.cz, which is the online giving tool that helps non-profits to raise funds online. And uh, after, few ye after two years, uh, of working, or three years now of working, I can say that it's uh, more and more successful and Czech NGOs are raising millions online now, thanks to that. Uh, that. I'm doing fundraising for a long and every, every place I go, I hear, it can't work, it's impossible, our people don't donate, nobody will give us, it's so complicated, etc. And it's partly true. Uh, this, uh, but only partly, and uh, I think that this, as I said, this is our role to change, change it. This is a World Giving Index. This is the index that uh, Charity Aid Foundation, together with the Gallup Institute, makes every year. And uh, they ask people all around the world three basic questions. Uh, in last month, have you donated to charity? Have you volunteered your time? And have you helped a stranger? And uh, according to the, to the answers to these three basic questions, they make a philanthropic map of the world. Unfortunately, the CE region is competing with Sub-Saharan Africa, who will be the worst in the, the world. So again, there is uh, so much space to you know, improve the philanthropic culture in our world. You can see that the most generous people live in Australia, second uh, are in Ireland, and the third ones are in the United States. According to how big is the circle, the more you know, generous are people in that country. And you can see that the circles in our region are quite small. And by the way, the smallest on the left is Russia. So there is still something that is worse. It's the number of givers, right? Not the amounts. It's a, it's a combination of these three questions. And here you can see the concrete examples from, uh, from CE region. And uh, unfortunately, Latvia, Estonia, etc., they are on a different uh, graph. But if you go, if you just type into into Google World Giving Index, uh, you can download it. Uh, you can see that uh, our countries are very diverse, even though the the region seems to be have very similarities. You can see how many people donated in each country, and the winner is Slovakia, which was quite a big surprise for me. I always thought that Czechs are the best, but uh, <laughs> you can see that in Czechs only 27% of people donated. You can also see that it's quite different how many people volunteer, and also how open they are to helping a stranger in need. But even though it looks uh, not so bad for Russia or maybe for uh, Bulgaria, you can see that it's still quite a big portion of our populations who are donating already. Another question is that uh, whether they are donating, you know, cash donations into things on the street or whether they are sending regular payments uh, as, uh, as Greenpeace donors. But you can see that still there is, you know, more than, yeah, in Poland, 28% of people donated last <coughs> month to charities. I think that this is really great potential. 
Uh, by the way, in Australia, it's about 70%. <laughs> or in UK, every two-thirds of economically active citizens have a direct debit to at least one charity. So they donate every month. And I think that this is our role as fundraisers, to convince people that they can change the world with us through their donations. Even though Czech Republic is on sixth in, in the region, you can see that philanthropic culture can change significantly even within one decade. This is a, these are the numbers of, of, from Czech Ministry of Finance, because in Czech Republic, if you donate at least 1,000 crowns mm -hmm. as an individual or 2,000 crowns as a company, you can deduct this donation from your tax base. And these are the numbers uh, from Ministry of Finance. How many, how much money people deducted in each year? And the, the red column are companies, the blue column are individuals. But it's important to say that for companies, we can expect that every company deducts their donation from the tax base because they have accountants, they have all the system in place. While individuals, many of them don't know that this possibility exists. And also the majority of people give less than 1,000 crowns. So this blue column is just a small part of the cake and nobody knows how, cake is, how, the, how big is the, the cake. What is important to see, you can see that from 2002 to 2010, Individual donations doubled and corporate donations tripled in 10 years' time. Uh, you can also see that 2002 was an exceptional year. We had uh, the worst floods in our history. And this world, uh, worst, uh, maybe you remember this, uh, this pictures of Prague, it was completely flooded, underground was destroyed for one year. And there was a really big wave of solidarity, especially among corporations, but also among individuals. And the good thing that this joy that people are having after they donate and they see the results of their donation, it really stayed with our citizens and our companies. And since then, it just it keeps growing. Even though in 2008, the corporation and also individuals, the donations dropped because of the crisis, now it's again on the rise. But what you can see is that really the trend is, is growing. There is more and more donors. And right now, we just discussed it with our colleagues that there is a very new trend in Czech Republic, and I'm sure that it will, it will be the same in your countries. There is more and more like generous entrepreneurs who are like 40 plus. They just sell their companies. They are rich guys, and they want to change the world for better. So they are establishing their own foundations. They are very generous donors. And just recently, I got a really great email from one guy who sent me an email like, hey, I'm 75, I just sold my company, I have enough money for the rest of my life and now I want to do something useful. So can I volunteer for you? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so now we have a really great IT expert. But, as I said, a lot of people are skeptical. They don't believe that it can happen. And I write down five myths I hear over and over again and five mistakes that NGOs are doing over and over again, so I would like you to be aware of them. The first one is that fundraising is begging. Fundraising is just harassment of people. It's, you, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so embarrassing to ask for money, and some people, or majority of people, don't feel really comfortable when they are asking for money. And I still remember when I started, you know, 11 years ago, and I had to write my first fundraising letter. I was not able to ask, ask for money because I, say, I, I was so shy. I was so, you know, afraid of how, how to do it. Now I would say that I'm rather cynical, which is uh, the other extreme. <coughs> but as long as you think of fundraising as a begging, you will never be successful. Because it's also it's a matter, matter of communication. If you beg, you use different language and different proposition than when you ask for support. And I will be talking about it later, and I'm sure that Magda and Marina will also explain you in detail how to, how to do this, how to be a storyteller rather than beggar. So please, it's not about begging, it's about giving people chance to be part of a change. Uh, many NGOs has failed because they had fundraiser and expected miracles. They saw that, okay, we have a fundraiser and in three months we will be flooded with money, everything will be solved, everything will work. It will not. <laughs> In Greenpeace, uh, it took us 10 years, 10 years of hard work to get to the state when we are fully self-sufficient and get enough money from Czech people. 
we needed a lot of support from our headquarters in Amsterdam. We needed a lot of patience. We needed a lot to come through a series of failures to find out what works and what doesn't. But never expect miracles. Fundraising is really a long run. Uh, it will never work here. It's another myth. I remember in 2002 when we started our first face-to-face -face campaign in Czech Republic. And I was responsible for that. I was like, hmm. So we should stop people on the street, ask them for regular donation and their bank account details. Nobody will ever do that. <laughs> Majority of our funds come from this method. 80% of the funds that uh, we, we have at the moment comes from the people that we stopped on the street and convinced them to give us all these details and allow us to, to debit their accounts uh, every month. There was even two years or three years ago, in Ch there was a fundraising festival in Czech Republic with this topic. It will never work here. And there was a long list of uh, different you know, topics that people thought it will never work, and it works. Sometimes you can't do just copy-paste, sometimes you need to do some customization, you really have to think there are some cultural differences, so of course the proposition might be different. But the methods are just universal, and some fundraising principles are universal, and it works everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you are Central European, or whether you are African or South American. <coughs> uh, another version of this myth is, we tried it and it didn't work. Uh, I usually ask, okay, and how, how you did it? Can you show me? Can you show me that example? And quite often we came to the conclusion that they tried it in a completely wrong way. And that's the reason why it didn't work. You know, if you, again, if you, if you do more begging than uh, proposing, proposing the change, of course it might not work. If you have no experience, if you do your first fundraising attempt, it might fail because you know every time if you do something for the first time it might fail. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't you should give it up and never try it again. Uh, I'm doing fundraising trainings quite often, and every time we have a discussion with some participants whether the fundraising is ethical or not. <laughs> is it ethical to ask people for their money? Why not? We are beyond. <laughs> Uh, I also have a lot of fights with our campaigners because our campaigners think that we should pro we should present all these hard facts, or these you know long bore boring stories about you know all what kind of uh, what these chemicals can you know cause to in the long term that we must be very scientific because you know we, we must be proud of being uh, having so such a, so many hard facts and I'm trying to explain them that no, we have to you know, make the message clear and short. One of the fundraising's uh, main mantras is KISS, keep it, keep it short and simple. And it's really hard sometimes to make some problems uh, short and simple. So, yeah, especially if it's such a, uh, such a difficult topic, so human rights, etc. But everything can be done, and again, we will show you a lot of examples, I'm, I'm sure, also. Mm -hmm. in uh, Another typical uh, thing is that we don't have to cooperate with the fundraiser. We hire someone, we sit them, put them somewhere in the basement, you know, <laughs> and they have to do their work. We don't have to give them information, they don't have to be part of, uh, of the planning. They just, you know, it's, it's their job to find this information. It doesn't work. Uh, three years ago, uh, when I was at VIA Foundation, we made uh, interviews with about 10 fundraisers, the most experienced fundraisers in our country and I asked them, what is the biggest obstacle of your work? And many of them, I think that all of them, in fact, said that the biggest obstacle is that people feel like the rest of the, of the organization just don't understand why we should be, you know, approaching individual donors, and they are, in fact, a bit embarrassed that we do it. Because, again, it's, the, it's connected with the first, uh, first myth that we are begging rather than asking people. <coughs> So please, if you, if you find fundraiser, give him or her as much support as, uh, as they need. And now in Greenpeace, they are coming through a big you know, mental shift. And now fundraisers are, pa are part of strategic planning, part of campaign planning, part of campaign implementation. And this is how it can work. Nobody can do it alone. And if you have any kind of questions, comments, or whatever, just write them, please. Otherwise, you can't stop me. <laughs> uh, 
Now I have a question for you. I showed you this uh, this uh, uh, research from Gallup Institute and from Charity Aid Foundation about how uh, how many people donated. So now I would like to ask you. Uh, please, can you remember the last time you donated? What was your motivation? Why you did so? To help. Can you be a bit more specific? Um, yeah. what, what was the cause or what, what was the, the thing that convinced you to? Uh, to the, the organization for homeless and you know, you just see the dire situation in Budapest with mm -hmm. that many people in the state and uh, you want to support them somehow. Mm -hmm. And okay. apart from giving to individual person in the street, you also understand that there is an organization which actually does uh, work for a bigger <laughs> group. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Because the people in the organization are my friends. Mm -hmm. I look great. Personal motivation. I, I give to uh, to organization which works with um, well people who have mental uh, illness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or, so uh, I, I, I have in mind neighborhood with people who are um, mentally sick. So mm -hmm. I have donated to the, to the charity. Great. I donated because someone asked me. <laughs> yes, I love you. This is my message. Okay, thank you very much. For that. So, anyone else? Were you instructed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I never <laughs> see that <laughs> many people. <laughs> anyone else has a. I never donate because they always ask me to donate for charity. <laughs> so maybe you should uh, ask yourself to the network or the organization. If I can answer the question. <laughs> okay, so last time I donated and I had the similar motivation. I know the people very well and I wanted to support them in their first fundraising efforts. So I donated to give them uh, hope that it will work. <laughs> <laughs> so but this is also my motivation. Yeah. I donate everybody who asks mm -hmm. just to check how it works. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's for curiosity. It's fundraisers who really, really do it for, yeah. for this reason. Yeah, because fundraisers know how hard the work is. <laughs> so <laughs> they want to support the others. Mm -hmm. But why am I asking this? Uh, if you want to uh, raise uh, support, if you want to bring friends into your organization, first of all, you need to think about motivation. Why should anyone give money to us? Why should anyone give money to our cause? Why should anyone be interested, should be interested in what we are doing? And I, I really like what, what you said. And here is a summary of it. These are the, the most common motives where people donate. First of all, people donate because somebody asked them to do so. Greenpeace in Czech Republic last year, we recruited about two and a half thousand new donors. 35 of them, slightly more than one, when less than 2%, came to us spontaneously. 98% of them we have to find and ask. There are, of course, some you know, really open-minded people, usually fundraisers from the other organizations. Now <laughs> 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 it's difficult that they come to, to you and say, hey, here are my money, I want to give it to you. But most of the people you have to ask first. And again, the whole rest of the day, I think, will be about how to ask properly and how to communicate with donors. Many people give because they care about the topic. I care about environment, so all donations I do, I have four standing orders coming from my account every month, and all of them go to environmental organization, different kind of environmental organization, because this is my topic. This is something I'm really interested in. <coughs> Other people have different, uh, different topics they think are important or are important social problems they want to solve. Uh, believe it or not, some people feel giving as their duty. It might be much more common in Poland where people are much more religious than in Czech Republic, for example. But for example, giving to others is a part of the, I think that every, every religion says that you should share with, uh, with, the, with the rest of, uh, of society. And also I mentioned earlier these uh, young or middle-aged entrepreneurs who are now rich and want to do something. They feel this as a their duty. They, were, they became rich because they were lucky mm -hmm. and now they want to share this luckiness with, uh, with the rest of the society. 
A lot of people give because they have personal experience with the issue. Because they really understand of what NGO is doing. Because they have, you know, they somehow get into the problem and they're helped by NGO. Uh, somebody in their uh, surrounding was ill and some NGO helped them or helped to solve the problem. So again, think about who might be interested, who might be connected to, to the issue we are working on. Uh, a lot of people give because they know the person who is asking. Be it the person, like the, really the human being, or be the NGO. That's why also PR is so important, because it's quite unusual that you donate to organization you never heard of before. You always want some proof. And I think that the problem of all of our countries is lack of uh, trust. People just don't trust to anyone. And they only trust to their friends, usually. So if friends is asking, it's always much, much more... Uh, much stronger ask than if some NGO is asking. And I'll show you the example of Via Foundation, how they use this kind of motivation to raise a lot of funds for Watchdog Fund. And some people give just because they want the world to be better. They really want to change it. They really believe that their gift can do at least a bit in changing the world. And again, it's about language, it's about proposition, it's about how you communicate with people. Do you really showing them that together you will change the world? Maybe then you will be much more successful. But private donors are not only individuals. They are also companies. And I showed you on the, on the chart that they, even, they have much more money than individuals. So why do you think that corporations give? Persons, people usually give because of altruism, because they want to do something, want to achieve something, they want to work to be a better place. Companies are not altruistic uh, <coughs> that much. So PR is definitely, advertisement is definitely one of the main reasons. Compensating for maybe something bad they do, like environmental companies, for example. Yeah, the biggest donor it's in Czech Republic. To take this money. Yeah, two biggest do the corporate donors in Czech Republic is Chess, who are running uh, is an energy company. You probably know it, all of you. They, they are present on the, the whole region. Uh, and the second is a coal mining company. So the biggest environmental destructors are the biggest donors, of course. Any other idea why why some company give money out? Instead of their image, mm -hmm. well, if they have tax reliefs, mm -hmm. then it's better for them to give as a donation um, instead of a tax mm -hmm. to the budget. So probably that that helps. Mm -hmm. Tax reliefs are definitely much bigger motivation for companies than for individuals. Yeah. So let's again make a list. And you mentioned probably most of them. Companies want to be good neighbors. They want to have a good image. They want to attract the best people to work for them. They don't want to have a problem in a community. They don't want to be the one that we is protesting in front of their... <laughs> but we don't take money from them. Uh, so for, for companies, it's very good to have a good relationship with, uh, with the municipality and with the citizens. Uh, they need a better image, as I said, especially if you do something uh, like pharmaceutical companies are another big donors because their image is very bad. Uh, many corporations use it as a marketing or PR opportunity. And again, they go donate to those NGOs that can offer them some kind of publicity. If you can't give them publicity, you will not attract this kind of companies, of course. Uh, some companies are just connected with the topic. Uh, for example, my favorite organization I donate to is Automat, which is an organization that promotes uh, public transportation in, in Prague, and they do bike parades and all this kind of stuff. And their natural ally is a company that produces uh, e eco how do you say eco e-bike, e e-bikes, like electronic the bikes. electronic bikes. Yeah. So this is a natural connection between these two. Uh, some companies, especially those the smaller ones, give because uh, their director or their owner is interested in, uh, in the work that you are doing. And then small companies behave much more like individual donors. For them, the marketing is not the main, main thing. It's about interest. Sometimes it's uh, not even director or owner, but their wives. They are also very important <laughs> because they, they really influence the decision of uh, where the money goes. 
And it was also mentioned that tax benefits are very important. So you should, uh, you should always you know, think about why should somebody give to us before I propose for the proposal project. Can you just comment on these ethical things? Like, uh, I mostly mean, what is your standard, for, mm. for example, for Greenpeace, for, from whom you are our, taking Our the standard point? is that uh, uh, we are not able to distinguish between good and bad guys, so we don't take any corporate money. <laughs> but I understand that not, <laughs> but not every organization can have a, such a strict policy, of course. But if you want to raise money for corporate, from corporations, I would definitely advise you that the first thing you do is that uh, you sit down with all your colleagues and you have a discussion about the ethics. <coughs> the ethics different from one organization to the other. And uh, I don't know, I was, for example, working with or helping an organization that works with uh, kids that are quite often like kids of uh, alcoholics, so from really you know, bad uh, social background and they were offered a gift from a uh, brewery. Mm -hmm. And they had to refuse it because they said, okay, we can't take money from the company that in fact causes the problem that we are solving. Mm -hmm. So these kind of things that you should really think of. There are some you know, companies that are naturally on your blacklist, like you know, gun producers or... But how do you handle the situation if not the company, but let's say the owner or the executive director of, of uh, a, a nuclear plant would give you, I don't know, 500,000, what you said to this guy? Uh, we are screening every gift above five thousand dollars, and we would give this money back because we wouldn't take money from somebody who could compromise our mission. That's why we don't take money from corporation. But if we realize that somebody, you know, give us a, we are not able to check everyone. So it might be, we know that we have, for example, some check and chest employees giving to us because we are sending <laughs> emails to. To their address, but if they give uh, 100 crowns per month, which is like four, four euros per month, we don't think that they are doing it to influence our uh, decision making. <laughs> but if somebody would offer us such a big gift, we would refuse it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And how do you communicate to the companies? Do you have like, your rules on your website or somewhere saying that above this and that amount, we do the screening, and the screening is done according to that and that rules? Or no, we don't. Do we don't do it, we just say that we don't take money from corporations and time to time they send us money and they then, we then send it back to them <laughs> and explain them that we, are, we are really appreciate so this donation never but them, no we never take donation. money from corporations. Okay, that's but for example in their foundation we discussed because I was responsible for writing down the ethical code of our foundation and I realized that it's not possible. <laughs> that we can't really make a list of all these corporations we think that are not okay. So we came with other solutions and we created some kind of screening process. So uh, every time I came with a possible donor, I said, okay, I'm going to approach this company or this company offered us a gift and we set it on a staff meeting and every staff member uh, might raise a question or might raise the proposition that we will start this screening process and then everyone who wanted uh, had to fill in the form and there was like, six or seven basic questions. And the question was, uh, will uh, donation from this company compromise our mission? And the, uh, would, uh, uh, is there any risk of negative publicity because uh, we will you know, accept this donation? And questions like this. And the last one was, is it against your private personal Id identity? Like for example, I sense, um, yeah. And, and after we, we got you know, answers from all these people who are interested in the process, we realized, okay, if we take money from this company, it means that half of our team will leave. So then you balance, like, okay, <laughs> what's better? And yeah, we, several times we refused money, even though it was a lot of money, because it would definitely compromise the mission, or that it would cause a big internal troubles within the organization. So we said, okay, we really don't want this money. But again, if you want to raise money from companies, it's much easier than from individuals, but then the ethical discussion is a must at the beginning, because you must do it before you fundraise, because after the money are on your account, it's too late. <laughs> uh, fundraising is not only about money. Fundraising uh, is about, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's friends rising. It's about, you know, building a that building a base of the support for your organization. And of course, quite often you need money, money first. It's, it's best if the, if the results are money. But you can also, with corporations, you can't get sponsoring. 
which is like in, in the different tax, uh, tax regime. Sometimes you can get cost-related marketing. Uh, it's quite popular in Czech Republic. It means that company says that we will give, I don't know, 50 crowns from each product to this organization. Uh, you can have gifts and services in kind, and it's in fact the, the easiest way how to start. You ask for a sub service, you ask for, for a product for this company, because for them it's the easiest way to, to give. They don't, yeah, if, they want, if you want money, there might, there might be some you know, approval processes, whatever. If you just call them, okay, I need you know, your product, it's the easiest way how to, how to get uh, in touch with them. You also can get volunteers. I think that it's, uh, the, it's all around, spreading all around the region, especially big corporations. They have all these volunteering programs for their employees, so you can get uh, like a really qualified volunteers who will help you with your I don't know, financial planning, with your marketing, with your PR campaign. Like for example, when I was in VR Foundation, uh, one of our big donors was T-Mobile, and they have this special program for their, for their employees that they can work three days per year for non-profit, and T-Mobile is paying their wage. So every year I had three days with their head of marketing, and this was the best you know, advice I could get. I, I, it was much better than you know giving us money because they gave us their know-how and expertise. You can also have a lot of information, skills, and experiences, and sometimes it's much easier how to open the door if you ask for time or for information or for a consultation. I remember that uh, once I uh, I approached uh, one very very rich man and I just asked him for one hour of his time. I said, okay, we have our project and we think that you are really the best consultant that can help us to you know, finish this project. So could you please you know, give me one hour of your time? So we spent one hour together. He replied immediately because he was, you know, people ask, usually ask him for money. So if I asked him for his time, he was a bit surprised. So we met very, very easily, even though he was a very busy man. And at the end of this one hour, when I explained him what their foundation is doing and why this you know, Academy of Social Entrepreneurship is so important, he said, okay guys, I like it. <laughs> and he, I'm thinking about giving you some money. <laughs> so one advice would be, if you ask for money, you can get advice. If you ask for advice, you can get money. So remember that. And as I said, you can get many useful contacts. All the, like for example, with Pia Foundation, we were financed mostly by corporations. And when we started, when we started individual fundraising, we said, okay, who knows us best? The managers of these corporations. So whom should we ask? The managers of the corporations. And they were our first uh, donors, and quite generous donors, and they are still donating to their foundation because they all of us, they knew us personally, and now they are really, you know, great ambassadors of the organization. So, you can see that uh, fundraising is not only about money, it's about much more. Uh, I think that I can easily skip it. Probably you all know it. You need money to survive. You need money to pay uh, rent, you need money to pay salaries. If you don't have them, your organization will be lower and more, less influential. I think that the big topic for all of you is the dependence on governmental policies, EU policies and everything. More individual supporters you have, more independent you are. That's easy. Uh, many of you mentioned that you are campaigning to change legislation, to change the attitudes of politicians stronger support you have, the more successful you are. For Greenpeace now, with our big mailing list and with all these donors, for us it's quite easy, easy to influence legislation or to influence the behavior of some company because if thousands of people start to write you or call you or email you, then of course the politicians are much more aware than if it's just about lobbyist who is you know, knocking on the door over and over again. And more donors you have, the better you can plan your future. So again, very shortly, what are the main principles? It was said already, you have to ask, you have to ask, you have to ask. This is the first uh, mantra. You have to sell your project. You really have to you know, explain what you are doing, why you are doing it, and that you need money to, to finish it. And never forget to say thank you. First donation you raise from a donor is like a first date. And then it's up to you how you will follow it up. And if just, you know, somebody send you money and nothing happens, no thank you, no appreciation, how this person will feel? 
And what is the chance that they will give you a game? Much lower than if you say, if you just pick up phone and say thank you, or if you just drop email and thank you, say thank you. But even the big uh, organizations in Czech Republic that knows that very well just don't thank for their donors, for their donations, and then they are very surprised that donors charge just a bank give donors and then one of the donors and then go and find somebody who will treat them much better. People give to people. Uh, if you go to a website, is there at least one human face that people can find? Or is it just an institution? We realize, for example, that since we uh, put uh, pictures of our campaigners into our emails, our fundraising appeals are much more important, uh, much more uh, successful because people can relate to somebody who is also a human being and not just some institution. Uh, credibility and accountability, I, I hope that uh, for organization of all your type, I don't have to explain you how important it is to be accountable. The, the number one asset that all of us have is our uh, credit. If you lose your credit, you can use it, you can use it in one day and you will not be, you will not be able to build it back in you know, years. And I know a lot of examples of organizations that just you know, did a very stupid thing and it just you know, killed them. And those engagement is a, is a key. And I'm sure that Marina and Magda will also talk about it, how, how to engage donors, how to explain them that what you are doing is the, the so good for them. And so, uh, in fact, Greenpeace, uh, our fundraising strategy is now about not only to raise funds for the people, but also give them opportunity to campaign with us. And more and more we are trying to do so, more and more we are successful and our donors are much more stable and they are really willing to, to donate to us for on long term because we explain them how long, uh, how long term goals are we trying to, to solve. And I might show you one video that just uh, summarizes it all. <coughs> This is the video that we produced to thank our supporters. You can see our uh, director, international director. <coughs> so maybe later. Be. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So many people online. Mm -hmm. But I, I, yeah, I know that girls will show you some other videos. So. So just a short summary before I show you some uh, examples of Czech uh, successful uh, watchdog, uh, watchdog fundraising. What do you need to succeed? You first of all need motivated <coughs> fundraiser. You need somebody who will really like the job, not someone who will be just, you know, appointed, okay, now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. Uh, you need strategy. And I'm sure that also girls will talk about it, that you need good plan. If you are just, you know, skipping from one thing to the other, you will probably not be very successful. I was talking about support from your team, so when you find your motivated fundraiser, please give him or her as much support as you can. Fundraising is a really difficult job, and if they are fighting even within the organization, it just you know demotivates people a lot. And I know a lot of fundraisers that after one year were just squeezed lemons and left the organization hating it <laughs> till the end of their life. So probably no, none of you want this to happen. Uh, you need to actively communicate with people. You need to really engage them in what you are doing and give them more opportunities than just donation. Uh, quite often it happens to me that I sign some petition or I, you know, I sign up for some email or newsletter and nobody talks to me and then suddenly after one year I get an email and I'm like, what? Who is writing me? I don't really remember that I was part of this campaign a year ago. So what my suggestion would be Every time you collect uh, contacts for your, for your supporters, just be in touch with them immediately. If you are on Greenpeace mailing list, you will receive email from us probably every two weeks. So you are really, you know, you are really updated in, with what we are doing. Uh, fundraisers need to learn every day. Fundraising is changing so fast. Marketing is changing so fast. And uh, everything like for example, now we are sol solving the problem that face-to-face -face fundraising worked for us great for 15 years, but the time of face-to-face -face fundraising in Czech Republic is over. So we have to learn something new. We have to come with some new ideas, like how to 
how to finance our organization when our cash cow is dying. So we really need to learn, we need to have a look on what the others are doing. That's why also I'm supporting so many organizations. So what are the new ways? Tell us. For us, it's now it's online. I already mentioned that you need a lot of patience. It will not come overnight. Your donors will, uh, it will take a yeah, few years before you succeed. So patience is the, the number one uh, thing that every fundraiser must have. And I already mentioned that you need good PR. People must know you before you approach them for, for donations. So just a, a repetition, get people on board, thank them immediately. Keep them informed and engaged. Find a way how they can you know, help you with your campaigns, with your organization, how they can volunteer for you as well. Uh, ask for regular support or ask for support regularly. You can, do, you can regularly ask for regular support. <laughs> and by the way, it works. Like majority of our donors, our regular supporters, they give us money every month just because they are always asking for monthly support. <laughs> Again, it's a question of, uh, of us. And you should test, you should measure the results, you, sh you really need some numbers, you really need to find out what works and what doesn't. So you invest your time and energy and money into things that will bring the results, not depression. Uh, Marina and Magda will also talk about it uh, in much more detail, how you should talk to people. Please, when you write an email or let letter to your potential supporter, Forget all these grand proposals, forget all this EU language, forget all these long, boring sentences that nobody understands to. If people, if you have long, boring sentences with a lot of, you know, foreign words, nobody will read it. And if people don't understand, they just, you know, skip. Why should I, you know, torture myself by reading something like that? So, Fundraising from private sources is a completely different language than uh, grant, uh, grant writing to foundations. So please be aware. Uh, again, talk about you and them. Talk about them, about how you together can change the world, how you can change, uh, how you can achieve things. And of course, be, case, be responsible. And this is the main message I would like to give you. And it's again connected with the begging I was talking uh, at the beginning. Quite often, uh, uh, quite often NGOs in Czech Republic presenting themselves as a losers. Please, please, we are so desperate. Nobody wants to give us money. Could you be the first one who will do it? <laughs> do you think that somebody would react? No. <laughs> so, Greenpeace doesn't beg. Greenpeace ask. And we say you, hey, together with you. We can achieve it. We can make it reality. We need your support. We know that it will be difficult. We know that it will be long. But we are sure that we can make it. And this is uh, the way of language that people much better you know, react to than if you say, oh, it's so different, it's so important, so, so difficult. OK, and I promised you examples. So this is how we set up. Uh, individual fundraising in their foundation. Their foundation has one program which is called Fast Grants and these are small grants of about one to two thousand dollars that you can, run, you can get for, uh, it's uh, mostly from grassroots small watchdogs like organizations that are fighting against, you know, construction of a company or construction of an incinerator for example or building a highway or, you know, destroying cultural monuments and building supermarkets instead of it. This kind, of, uh, this kind of projects. And in the past, it was supported by uh, American foundations, but the American foundation said, hey guys, you are adult now. You should raise your money yourself. So we tried, and we tried something that was called peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. It's called peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. When we ask our donors to fundraise for us. And again, I was a bit skeptical at the beginning. I was like, okay, it works in the US, but can it work in Czech Republic? And realize it can. It's just like, again, how you approach. You need to find the first ambassadors that will help you with that. And you need to find a bit more fun in it. So the first attempt we did, and we raised $2,000 with that. You can see on this big picture, on the small picture, uh, up uh, the director of your foundation. This is the guy in, uh, in black. 
and we challenged him with the, with the idea that every one of us will donate 1,000 crowns if he will be running Prague Marathon dressed as Pink, pink Panther. <laughs> and then we sent a uh, personal email to everyone who knew our director personally, to our corporate donors, to, our, you know, to all the people around uh, the organization. And we said, if you donate 1,000 crowns, we will together convince Yiri to become a Pink Panther. And people love it. We had such a, you know, great responses to this, uh, to this activity. So we raised at the end something like three or four thousand dollars just for this uh, grant fund. And then we start to build on it. And at the moment, uh, because this, this, the idea is that uh, there is Prague Marathon three times a year, and it's in, in, in a foreign country, for example, UK or US. It's a typical way how NGOs raise funds. Somebody run for an organization and ask their friends, their peers, to, to give money to support them. So we started to build on this idea. And at the moment, after four years of really, you know, finding a new way to attract more people, how to make it fun, how to make it attractive, this uh, activity raises enough funds to support all this program for, uh, for the whole year. And again, we have a people who are running at the moment, there's almost 50 people who are runners for the FIA Foundation. Uh, there, there is a lot of support that they can receive. This, these are people from foundation. This, they say, thank you. So if you donate to this fund, you receive a personal email saying, thank you very much. This is what we achieved with your donation. And each runner, also in the past, this is the old version, each runner had an online giving form. So he or she can send it or share it on Facebook and raise funds for this, uh, for this activity. And they, this year they, they even, they made a facelift of this web. And uh, again, this is, the, this is the same campaign, version 2.0. And uh, the campaign is now called Don't Run by Runner. So you can come to this web page, you can choose which runner you want to support. Each runner has a short like a dedication by the you know, run for the organization, by the support via. You can also find out what will happen with the money. But to be honest, not many people are really interested in the grant making program. They, they, stop, they donate because they think it's fun. This is uh, Open Society Fund, one of the donors uh, of this uh, seminar. And to be honest, I don't know what are the results of their campaign, but I really like it. Because again, it's a fresh and it's fun. We had a, last year, we had a corruption scandal when one... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the man who, who is the like not mayor but the, the head of the city council. Regional, 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 regional. regional. He was uh, caught by police with seven million Czech crowns uh, in a wine box. <laughs> so seven million Czech crowns. It was a bribe, you know, for. So Open Society Fund next day started a campaign in Vino Veritas because it was in wine box and for 777 crowns you could buy a bottle of wine and support anti-corruption fund. I don't know how many bottles they you know distributed in this way but I just think that this is the way how we should think about fundraising. Make it fun and explain what we are doing in this kind of way. Another way how, uh, how Open Society Fund is raising funds is uh, that they made a partnership with the Corruptur. We have a, uh, it's a, it's a company called Corruptur and they are very successful, they are really well known. They have a great you know, campaign in the media. And what they do is that it's really, you know, they take a bus and go around Prague or around the country to the, to the spots that are somehow connected with corruption. So they just, you know, they show you houses of the, of this guy that I know, very well known as, uh, as being the influencers of politics, etc. And it has a really great media coverage because it's, you know, something very new. And uh, they started to do fundraising that they say, uh, earn money with us on corruption, become a shareholder, shareholder of our, you know, company. And by being a shareholder, you will donate money to Open Society Funds to fight corruption. And also they made it, the, the whole concept that I really like, if you donate money to become a shareholder, 
they will, you know, meet you on some strange place with somebody with, you know, big glasses, so you can't really recognize who gave you the share. So they really play with the idea. And I think, again, that this is a very nice example. This is my favorite campaign. <coughs> and I'll show the, the whole that because I found it it's in English. Uh, Martin maybe can tell you more because Ojiveni is part of this campaign. It's uh, called Reconstru Reconstruction of State. And I really like it. I really like the web and I really you know, uh, suggest you to go there and have a look because they have English page. It's very easy. And again, it's about very short message. We know how to do it. We have a plan. We need your support. And you can see that it doesn't look like a regular uh, NGO site. This is this, the, these are the nine laws that the reconstruction of the state want to enforce. You can also click on it. You can see you know, how much uh, stuff was already done. And you can also become a donor. You can become ambassador. And you also have the faces of experts who are beside this campaign. And unfortunately, the YouTube is not, uh, not working because I would like to show you the <laughs> video that they created for this campaign. And I really like it. And spontaneously, I think that without any much effort, I don't think that they have fundraiser. I think that most of the donations are really spontaneous. But they already raised more than 1 million crowns from people who are interested. Again, because uh, this, uh, and this is another thing that is very unusual. This project is a common project of the biggest anti-corruption NGOs in Czech Republic. So it's transparency, it's Ojiveni, and uh, many others. So please have a, have a look on this project because it is, is a lot about communication, how to communicate it clearly in a human language and really explain what you are trying to achieve with the money. And if you click on uh, support us, you will also get a list of what will happen with your money. And you will find the, uh, aha, it's English version is not updated. <laughs> <laughs> there is more than one million already. <laughs> But again, you have here the list of things, what will happen with your money, how they will be used, and there is also the budget. Aha, it's only in Czech version. In Czech version, you see the budget, and how much is already raised, and how much is missing. You can, you can try the YouTube, because you will not see the buffering. Mm -hmm. So you can try, maybe it works, because it worked yesterday. Yeah, but there is more people online now. Yeah, but I'm seeing yeah, 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 people right. online. I can see the problem. Right? <laughs> 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 my name very well. Like they are. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, I'll send you a link to these videos because. And by the way, this uh, video, you can see how many views they already had. I think this is the record in Czech uh, nonprofit sector. I don't know any other Czech video that would have so many views. It will take some time, so just a few more examples because I think that I'm running out of time. And another example how to get people involved in your in your organization. I really like what Amnesty is doing in Czech Republic. Uh, they have uh, this uh, charitable dinners. It's called Svičková Amnesty, because uh, Amnesty has a candle in their sign. And Czechs, we have a, a typical Czech meal that is called like a candle sauce. It's not made from candles. <laughs> it just is like that. You can see that 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 Hi, Czechs. Do you know that you have more corruption than in Botswana? <laughs> it's a very nice example. Maybe later when we have time or in the, in the evening. So just 
two more examples. So what Amnesty is doing, that they have this reg regular charitable dinners, they made a partnership with one restaurant, quite a posh restaurant in Prague, and you can donate to, or you can support Amnesty by coming there for a dinner. This is a concept I really like. And Via Foundation is, by the way, doing the same. They just want for much more money than Amnesty. <laughs> But is the restaurant also supporting mm -hmm. like that uh, all yeah. income comes to Amnesty? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You just go there, you have this candle sauce with Amnesty. They are talking about you know the current campaigns and uh, you, you are served a nice dinner and it's also it's another way how to get your donors engaged because you know you only find them personally, you meet them personally and personal contact is the best one. Yeah. So now skepticism. Is it possible for not organization that is that well known as Amnesty or uh, Via Foundation I understand Via that also we are not known. it's okay. not known. Okay. Via Foundation is known among non profits who are applying for uh, for grants. <laughs> Our Battery Foundation. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah it's the same like do you think that Polish people know Battery Foundation? Well as a okay. Yeah but <laughs> from another side like. But again, like uh, when we started with their foundation to think about individual donors, we again came to this donor motivation and we said, why somebody should support development of civil society? So we were thinking about, okay, it must be people who know South personally because they are corporate donors of the foundation, for example. Or we started to really think about who might be those that would come and then we started to really pay a lot of attention to, you know, get known among these guys first and then uh, uh, approach them for the nation. So, yeah, uh, like, yeah, if you are a watchdog organization, you will never be like Greenpeace or Save the Children, all this like, you know, well-known organization that have, you know, millions of supporters around the globe. Your uh, target audience is definitely much, much smaller, but it's still there. It's, st it's again only about, you know, defining your target groups and approaching it in the right way. And what I really like, for example, what Amnesty did is that they made, uh, every year they, they, they do a cinema screening, so you support Amnesty by going to the cinema. And this year they even managed to, to get the Monty Python's film that wasn't, you know, uh, broadcasted in Czech Republic uh, never before. So again, it was something really special. You had the only chance to see it was by supporting Amnesty and paying, you know, donation to this organization. Or another way how to, you know, find clever donors, they made a check, uh, check met, uh, tournament and you can play the checks with uh, one, of the, uh, one of the masters of, uh, of checks. Check. Chess. 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 Sorry. Chess. Chess. Check. <laughs> okay, and the last example, this is my, this organization I also support and I think this, this is the best Facebook uh, fundraising post I've ever seen. Uh, this guy is the Thai box world champion, and he's vegan. You can see it on his uh, on his T-shirt. And uh, <laughs> I don't know whether you know Nesehnutí. Nesehnutí is a small organization from Brno, and they uh, they do uh, they fight for animal rights. Uh, they fight against the building of hypermarkets uh, all around the country. Uh, they uh, they have a campaign against the export of guns from Czech Republic, and I really like these guys. And this post says, this is the, I checked the Facebook, and surprisingly, this was their first fundraising post, and this is the post with the highest number of shares and likes from all the posts they have on their Facebook. And this post said, I know that in each fight, we need support, be it the fight against environmental destruction, against race and gender prejudices, be, or for the animal rights, or be it the fight in the ring. That's why I support Nestor and which of our activities do you like? Join us and uh, donate on the account. I don't know how many people really donated, but I think that this is exactly the way how you should present your organization and ask for donations. And just to sum it up, you first of all need to know what you are trying to do. Without a plan and without a goal, you can hardly achieve it. <laughs> Uh, I've said several times that you need to, to find your right target groups and probably for you the target groups will not be the whole population of the country. Your target groups will be, I don't know, educated people from big cities who are record donors and even smaller groups, somebody you should probably start from the people who know you as you were talking about the motivation and 
the defining the right target groups is the key to the success. And again, you have to think about what you want from them. Do you want them to donate first? Do you want to uh, sign up your newsletter? Do you want them to come to any of your actions? Whatever. But first of all, you have to really <coughs> think it carefully. And what will be your message? And then I, I turn the uh, two minutes to, to girls who will be talking much more about how to communicate and show you some examples. And it's easy. If you believe, you can achieve. <laughs> Oh. Bravo. Bravo.